Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Biology of SARS COVID 2 Past, Present, and Future. My name is Sonia Hunt and it's my pleasure to be your X Talks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes. This presentation includes a QA session with our speaker. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speaker throughout this presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the presentation or at the Q&A session. Now, this chat box is located in the control panel, and that's found on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require assistance, please contact me at any time by sending me a message using that chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available to you for future streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank GenScript who developed the content for this presentation. GenScript is the leading contract research organization in the world, providing gene, peptide, protein, CRISPR, and antibody services. Since its foundation in 2002, GenScript has grown exponentially through partnerships with scientists conducting fundamental life science research, translational biomedical research, and early stage pharmaceutical development. The company is recognized as having built a best-in-class capacity and capability for biological research services, encompassing gene synthesis, peptide synthesis, custom antibody and protein engineering, and in vitro and in vivo pharmacology, all with the goal to make research easy. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to your speaker for today's webinar, and he is Dr. Benjamin Tenover, Professor of Microbiology and the Director of the Virus Research Institute at New York University. Benjamin completed his postdoctoral training in virology from Harvard after receiving his PhD in medicine from McGill. He is presently a professor of microbiology and the director of the Virus Research Institute at New York University. He is a Fulbright scholar and the recipient of a presidential award in science and engineering. Benjamin's research program focuses on the interactions between viruses and their hosts with a specific emphasis on SARS-CoV-2 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. His lab is supported by the National Institute of Health, the Department of Defense, and the World Health Organization. Now it's my pleasure to pass over the mic over to Benjamin. So Benjamin, when you're ready, you may begin. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sonia, and thank you to all of you who are uh, attending this webinar. Uh, I, I certainly am looking forward to a day where we can do these events in person, uh, but this is uh, one of the silver linings of the pandemic in that at least when you give a seminar, really there are no uh, boundaries or time zones that um, stop you from being able to attend uh, such an event. And in that light, I hope that this is a, a seminar that you find uh, enjoyable. And as Sonia said um, so kindly, um, please be, feel free to interact. Um, the, probably the more you interact with me and the more questions you provide via the chat, the the better this talk uh, will probably go. Um, so with that, you know, I, I was given the task um, by, by GenScript, who uh, has really uh, been very supportive in our research here to give this talk on the past, present, and future of, of SARS-CoV-2. And uh, obviously that's, that's quite a feat to do in, in 45 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna give you um, a taste of all these things. Um, and like I said, feel, please feel free to ask any questions um, should anything require more detail or you wanna know more about something. Um, you know, since the pandemic began, actually, prior to the pandemic, I was working on influenza and prior to that um, on a variety of other different viruses. And so my research is always kind of focused on how host and virus respond to each other. Uh, and then of course, because of the pandemic, our lab switched to focusing on SARS-CoV-2 almost exclusively for the past couple of years. And I've been using this title slide ever since uh, that began and just watching these numbers climb. And as of yesterday, we hit the 400 million mark of the number of confirmed cases. Uh, as the deaths approach uh, 6 million. So clearly, uh, you know, a, a life-changing event for all of us. Uh, next slide. And so just to, uh, you know, give us all a sense of at least the past, the first part of our title was, um, I'm sure as many of you are, are well aware, um, and, you know, in 2019, really at the end, during kind of the winter break for most of us, uh, there was this, you know, 
gurgling of the media about a, a virus of unknown origin or maybe a bacteria of unknown origin that was coming out of China. Uh, and it was quite clear that it was it was somewhat concerning. Um, but the truth was is that it wasn't the first time that you know events like that had happened and then fizzled out into nothing. And so it probably wasn't until early January where we learned that actually this uh, the agent underlying this this unknown um, pneumonia was actually a very close cousin of the virus that we saw in 2003, and that is uh, that mo we, most of us in the, in the lexicon just refer to it as a SARS, um, which is um, uh, part of a, a much larger family called beta coronaviruses, um, and this one was a very close relative called SARS-CoV-2. Um, and really what made SARS-CoV-2 different than the SARS from 2003 was really just its external protein called spike. So the attachment protein that a virus needs to be able to engage a cell and get into that cell, um, it looked like the entire genomic structure of the virus was almost identical to the 2003 strain, except that the, 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 the spike protein uh, had changed dramatically. And the closest relative to that spike protein was another beta coronavirus that came out of pangolins, which are Kind of this weird ant-eating look, look like uh, animal. Um, and so this theory was born that perhaps an animal got infected with two different coronaviruses and this kind of hybrid of the two uh, emerged out of that. Um, but since that time, I think we've come to realize that there are actually population of bats out there that have SARS-CoV-2 relatives that are very close to its original sequence. And so it probably just came from a bat. Um, in any case, uh, it slowly, um, uh, migrated through Asia, it went uh, into Europe, and um, you know, actually, I think it was the the impact it had on Italy that made it very clear that no amount of climate or weather or genetics were ever going to stop this, and that we were all in for a pandemic. And indeed, in March, the World Health Organization declared it as a pandemic, um, and at that moment in time, we already had a pretty good sense of what mortality was going to look like. It obviously skewed towards uh, the elderly. Um, and those with comorbidities, which you know is very reminiscent of influenza. And one of the perhaps uh, saving graces of SARS-CoV-2 was that it, at least it spared children. Uh, and that's probably because children in general have less of this ACE2, this angiotensin II converting enzyme, which is the target of that spike protein that allows it to get into cells. And so because especially kids prior to puberty have less ACE2, um, it's more difficult for the virus to infect and cause disease in them. And so for that reason, we have this very strange skewing of mortality. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is the beast that we're all talking about. Uh, this is the, the, how the genome of the virus looks. Um, I'm unaware of the uh, overall makeup of my audience here, so I'm going to talk in, in um, relatively um, less scientific terms wherever I can. And so this virus, is, this is the genetic material it's made out of, and it's camouflaged to look very much like the same kind of material our cells make, something called messenger RNA. And so as soon as this, this this RNA structure gets into your cells, it immediately engages the host cell machinery to start making some of its own proteins. So the first thing it does is it creates, uh, we call it a polyprotein. So where you see ORF1A, that stands for open reading frame 1A. And what you're looking at there is it's simply going to translate this mRNA into a protein. And that protein will get cut up by uh, a virus protease, like a pair of scissors that will cut up the protein into many pieces. Um, and all of those pieces are going to assemble together to make a machine that can use RNA to make more RNA. And that's not a machine that humans have, but it's a machine that obviously RNA viruses need if you're going to live in this world of RNA um, only kind of space. Then the virus has another trick up its sleeve. It has many tricks. Um, the next trick it does is you can see there's a kind of a, uh, another box right beside ORF1A called ORF1B, but it's offset a little bit and it's changed in color. And that's because those instructions have a small mistake where the blue and the brown lines meet together. Um, and it's not really a mistake, but if you were to look at it from, you know, a, a, an, from a very high level, it would seem like the virus made an error. But what it's actually doing is it's capitalizing on the fact that that error will be incorrectly processed, say, one in every hundred times it gets processed by our host cells. And so it's a way for the virus to make more protein from that ORF1B um, frame um, than it's going to that it's going to need. And so this virus does this trick, so it makes a lot of ORF1A, but a lot less of ORF1B because it needs a lot less of ORF1B. Ultimately, though, these two, these two polyproteins get cleaved into this massive RNA-making machine. 
Um, and then the real biology begins. And the, everything that happens downstream of that, that S is for spike, that's the one I was just mentioning, we'll see that in a minute, as well as all these other uh, accessory genes behind that. Um, they are really the, um, there are a variety of structural components and components that are gonna interact with the cell, but it's actually the biology of the virus uh, concerning those genes that I really wanna talk about next. So we go to the next slide. So I mentioned that ORF1A and ORF1B, this now red and blue boxes you see, they're gonna become this, this massive machine called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's just a, a huge complex that can take RNA and make new RNA using RNA as substrate, which is something, like I said, we don't do. But after it's made that machine, um, this virus performs this really uh, extraordinary trick. And it's really, I think, this trick that separates SARS-CoV-2 biology from, say, influenza and what makes it more serious to us. And so what, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna make a miniature version of a genome um, that's much, much smaller than this massive 30,000 nucleotide genome. And to do that, it's gonna start replicating, uh, pretending it's replicating. So it's going to make a new strand. So it's gonna bind where it says three prime there on the end of the genome. And it's gonna start making a new complementary strand at that you know, 29,674 position. It's gonna start moving back towards the five prime end to make a genome. And if, you know, without my pointer here, um, if you just look down where the, it says these two TRS elements are really close together, that stands for a transcriptional regulatory sequence. And the main take home message here is that when the, this machine, this RNA dependent RNA polymerase gets to a TRS element, it needs to jump essentially from one strand of the genome to get to the other strand of the genome. And it needs to do this because in order for that machine to recognize RNA as viral RNA, it needs to have the exact same ends as the genome uh, in the beginning had, that same five prime and three prime sequence. And so in order for the virus to do this, it makes smaller genomes that are mostly comprised of what's on the three prime end of the genome, but they're adding on a little piece of the five prime end. And because the machine has to do these acrobatics on the RNA, it results in the production of a lot of pieces of RNA that are going to fall off, are going to be broken, are going to be two pieces of RNA stuck together. And all of those things, all of this aberrant RNA, um, are all the trigger points for the way we our cells anyways, recognize virus and elicit a response to that virus. And so what's interesting about this is that, you know, to put it in, in maybe more colloquial terms is that this virus is very sloppy. It, it makes a very, it makes a mess. I mean, I have two little kids at home and like, you know, if you gave them um, carte blanche in a, in a room full of, of toys or really anything, you know, if you gave them a couple of hours, they would cut, create massive chaos in that room like any average kid would, right? And I would think that SARS-CoV-2 is very similar in that regard. It's, it's taking over the cell and you're gonna see in a minute, it really does take over the cell. So it doesn't really care that it's making a mess because it's about to destroy the cell anyways, but it's the mess that it makes that creates all the consequences downstream that cause us disease. And so that's why we're talking about it. And this is really the underlying reason why it's because it has this funny biology where this RNA dependent RNA polymerase is forced to jump from one end to the other end. Next slide. All right, and so you can see that. Um, so this is using an antibody that recognizes two pieces of RNA stuck together or double stranded RNA. And so the, those RNAs I was talking about where the jumping is necessary and you know, I was equating it to the virus making a big mess, we call those subgenomic RNAs. So that little S little G RNA, the subgenomic RNA is the shorthand for all of those products. And what you're looking at here is um, an antibody that recognizes when you have this double-stranded RNA present. And now our cells should never have double-stranded RNA. Double-stranded RNA is, is a universal sign for a virus. And that is for the same reason uh, we don't have an, uh, a machine that makes RNA from RNAs because we use DNA as our, you know, essentially our hard drive to run programs. Whereas RNA viruses have to live in an RNA world where they only go from RNA to a different type of RNA. And so that they make this machine. And as a result is what you're replicating and making more of yourself, you're always going to have intermediary products that have two pieces of RNA in very, very close proximity to each other that can form helical structures, very much like what our DNA does, but as two pieces of RNA. And since that's something we, you and I would never produce, we have evolved to be able to recognize that structure and, um, and elicit a response to it. And so this antibody is looking to the presence of that. And so in an uninfected cell in mock on the left here, you see absolutely no green signal. And on the right, you see a lot of green signal showing that this virus is making a very large mess of every cell that it infects. Um, I do see a question here, but it's one I'm gonna get to it later on anyway. So I'm gonna hold off onto that one. 
but please keep your questions coming. I, I like them. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, okay, so what do we do in response to this? Okay, so this again, this is going to be a very high level, but to the left here, this is my cartoon version of SARS coming in. So that green uh, shaped thing on the outside, the studded circle, that is the spike protein or S gene um, that is going to allow this virus to get into a cell. And so it's going to bind something on the surface of your cells, um, which is of course this angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. And so cells that have ACE2 um, are naturally susceptible to this virus. And so it's going to bind that ACE2 receptor. The binding of that receptor is going to trigger a process where the cell brings in stuff from the outside. Um, the virus is going to escape that process and get into the cytoplasm. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And it's going to start translating. If you remember, we're going to translate that ORF1A and that ORF1B to make our machine that takes RNA and makes more RNA from it. And so if you kind of follow this kidney shaped product down, these are just kind of very simple cartoon depictions of this virus that's replicating. But it's generating, you can see a purple squiggly line and an aqua squiggly line. This is my uh, attempt to depict double-stranded RNA in the cell. And so there are proteins that just hang out in your cells and all of your cells ubiquitously that are looking for the very production of this kind of double-stranded RNA. And so two good examples of this that were recently discovered you know, five or six years ago now are uh, RIGI and MDA5. And the names don't matter, of course, but what they're doing is when they can when they can sense the production of double-stranded RNA, that equates to that cell that there's a virus present and then that virus is likely replicating because it's creating this double-stranded RNA intermediate. And as a result, it goes through this, um, it basically engages a program, it turns a program on through a number of transcription factors and kinases and all of this machinery is very well known, but we're not gonna get into that, those kind of weeds in this talk. And ultimately we're gonna land on these two major activators. So they're written here as IRF3 and NF-kappa B. These are just, um, these are things that can turn your genes on or off. And uh, in this particular sense, the way this pathway works is when your virus or when your cell sees a virus, it's going to flip these switches so that IRF3 and NF-kappa B both turn on and they work together to initiate this antiviral response. And the way that works in general is that they uh, elicit um, the secretion of a protein called uh, interferon. And interferon, uh, there's different types of interferon, we won't need to get into that, but it basically gets secreted and it is a call to all the neighboring cells that says, hey, I detected double-stranded RNA in my cell. I think there's a virus here. So I'm secreting interferon so that all the surrounding cells can be aware that there's a virus and they can fortify their defenses before the virus gets there. Um, and that's exactly what happens. And so the interferon gets released, it binds to all the neighboring cells, it sets on another set of programs that culminate in the production of about anywhere from 200 to 300 different genetic genes that are all aimed at stopping virus infection through a whole variety of processes. And this is like how we have evolved as our first line of defense against virus infection. Um, next slide. And so in order for you to be a virus, um, you really have to be able to navigate this process. Um, and so to do so, um, you know, we basically every virus you've ever heard of that causes disease has to be able to shut down and block this. And so one of the things we do initially when a virus like this, um, you know, emerges is we try to figure out what this virus is doing that's allowing it to get past that interferon defense. Because if you can figure that out, often you can find drug targets or ways that you might be able to treat it. And so it, this is a relatively fancy way to do that. But what you're looking at here is something called single cell sequencing, where we simply look at infected cells in a dish, we throw virus onto them, but we throw virus onto the cells uh, at something we call a low multiplicity of infection, meaning there's many, many more cells than there are viruses. So the virus is gonna have to work in order for this to uh, really infect all of these cells. And then before we give it the time for this virus to infect all these cells, we actually stop the experiment and we take a snapshot of everything that's going on in that cell at that moment in time to get a sense of what is the virus doing to the cell and what's happening to all the cells around those infected cells initially just to get a sense of like this would be the very first couple of cells that get infected and in, say your your respiratory tract and so you know what we're looking at here on to the left here every dot is a cell and the orange dots are cells that are infected with virus and we know they're infected with virus because the snapshot that we took was a snapshot of all the rna in the cell and so this little heat map you're looking on on the right where there's a big block of red those are all the genes so red just means that you detected them and they're way up 
you can detect all of the components that make the virus in those cells, and that's why we know they're infected. And so in the orange cells, they're very much infected, and the cells that are purple, these are cells that are either just beginning to be infected or they're still uninfected, but they can respond to the signals that are being induced by the infected. And so in that way, you look at the, the snapshot of things that aren't viral genes, and what you find is kind of interesting because normally, um, what a virus does is it just shuts down that, those two switches. Or if you remember IRF3 and NF-kappa B, it just, it just it switches them off in a variety of different ways so that this initial defense can't ever get started. And one of the quirky things about SARS-CoV-2 is that it leaves one of those switches on. It turns one switch off, but the other one stays on, which is already quite unusual. So NF-kappa B stays on. So amongst the orange shells is one of the only things that's happening is that you have some limited host activity going on as well. And we'll talk about that in one minute. And then in the purple cells, this is much less surprising, but what you're seeing is that interferon. So you remember that warning signal of, we see double-stranded RNA, we're infected by a virus, get ready, fortify. That's happening in all the cells around us in this, in this particular culture dish. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a bit. Uh, next slide. All right, so we're gonna just take a slightly deeper dive into what's happening in those cells. And so on the left here, um, this is a truly remarkable graph that, that's probably lost on most people who don't uh, eat and breathe virus uh, biology every day. But if you take your, you know, your the best strand of influenza in a given winter that you know was causing a lot of disease and a lot of snotty noses, and you were to do this kind of experiment with them, if you looked in the cells that were infected with influenza, you know, and took a snapshot and said, okay, you know, let's say if you think of a cell as a computer, for example, and there's so much processing power the bandwidth that influenza would take having infected that computer or that cell is at best maybe 5%, meaning about 5% of the, the running memory is being dedicated to the virus, whereas 95% of the activity is still the, the computer doing its thing or still the cell doing its thing, depending on the analogy you want to use. And what SARS-CoV-2 does though is remarkable in that it goes well, well beyond 5% bandwidth and can achieve everywhere, anything over 60 to 80% bandwidth, meaning that at the moment in that 24 hour time period there where you see that, that bar graph go well above 70% of viral RNA, that means that we took a snapshot of these cells that were infected and those cells were more virus than they were human at the time of infection because the virus not only is very good at making more viral products, which is what we see uh, in the middle there, which I'll explain in a second, but it's also very good at getting rid of the host products. And so what's happening there is, um, again, this is still single cell sequencing, but we're, we're taking a snapshot, remember, of all the RNA, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. And so the yellow there, those are the new virus-specific genes that are coming up. So they don't exist in mock because they weren't infected, right? But the blue line should still go all the way to the top, except that um, we're not identifying all of the, the pieces of a cell that should be there because the virus is actively destroying them. And then on the right um, to that same point is the only blue that's remaining, meaning that since the virus is taking up so much of the bandwidth and leaving so little for the host to function, the only thing that really is functioning, and this is data where we look at the, the, the genomic DNA and we look to see what's still on, is what we see is that NF-kappa B, again, remember we had that oddity that NF-kappa B stays on. And there's a consequence to this, so that in infected cells, it's mostly virus with the exception of this one biology. And this one biology happens to be very much in charge of um, a different aspect of the defense, which we'll talk about next. Uh, next slide. Um, oh, and so I see a question here from the audience about how do we know about like relative abundance when we look at single cells? And that's that's actually quite easy because the overall um, numbers of a given cell, when you sequence a cell, the snapshots that you take, you know, you're going to get something like um, 100 million reads or uh, pictures of, of individual pieces of RNA. And so you can do everything as a percent of total. So, you know, if you want to look at gene X, you can say that gene X is, you know, 0.001% of all the components in a given cell. And so it's very quantitative to compare from one cell to the other cell. Um, but good question. Okay, so uh, back to our, our story at hand. Um, you remember we, we turned off, we saw that NF-kappa V was on, we saw that the host proteins were being destroyed and the virus was essentially taking over. And we learned early on that the virus is a bit of a slob. And so this is, again, kind of taking that same high level, but getting a sense of like where the virus is actually blocking. And so you can see that that IRF3 there is, is being attacked by three different products, a product called N, a product called ORF3B, and a product called PLP, which is actually a protease. 
And it's really investing a lot of energy in, in making sure that IR3 switch doesn't work anymore. And that makes a lot of sense because in the absence of that switch, you're not going to get the interferon output that the cell is going to want to elicit. And remember, that's the call to arms, right? That's this telling everybody to, to fortify and get ready. So if you can minimize that, that's definitely beneficial for the virus. And so it's not unusual at all that viruses do this. It's just unusual that the virus does it by targeting only IRF3, but leaving NF kappa B on. That part's a bit quirky. And then on the right-hand side, this is for the cells where maybe they saw interferon before they got infected. Even in those cells, this virus has a number of antagonists in its bag of tricks, um, one of them being this NSP1, which kind of destroys all the host RNA. So we saw that in the single cell sequencing. And they also do tricks like they prevent some of the, these, these much needed switches, these transcription factors from going into the nucleus where the genes are to turn on. So if you can stop that process, you can also stop the cell from eliciting any kind of defenses. So this is kind of like the virus takeover at a cellular level. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I wanted to take you one step higher to let, help you understand the, the consequences of NF kappa B. So this is still the same thing we we're looking at. I'm just taking away some of the graphics. And so if you remember, the very first thing that happened was we made double-stranded RNA. So in the business, we refer to these as PAMPs or pathogen-associated molecular patterns. They are things that viruses or pathogens make that we don't ever make as humans. And as a result of that, we have evolved to recognize those structures as something that we should elicit a response to. And so those things that make that recognition, we call them pattern recognition receptors. That was the RIGI and MDA5 I mentioned briefly. Then those guys go through a, a variety of pathways to turn these switches on. And those switches are controlled by things like transcription factors, which are NF kappa B and IRFs. And then those elicit a cellular response to achieve what we're trying to achieve. And when it, as, it, as it relates to viruses, we're really trying to achieve two things. And so first to the right, so, as I mentioned earlier, is this call to arms. So that is, remember, NF kappa B and IRF3, we switch them on, the cell releases interferon, and it warns all the neighboring cells, a virus is coming, fortify, get ready, right? That is a very important part of this immune response, but complementing that part is the left pathway, which is mediated by NF kappa B. And that is more a call for reinforcements. And that is to say that you know, if this is happening in your lung or in some tissue and the virus is taking a foothold and replicating, it's very often that the call to arms is not sufficient enough to actually kill the virus or neutralize the virus. It's really only there to do its best to slow the virus down. In order to actually like resolve the infection, you need some professional immune help. And that's where the call for reinforcements comes in. And so NF kappa B is a major driver of that. So it sends out basically a warning signal in this form of other secreted proteins called chemokines. And it's gonna create almost a, a yellow brick road trail where the most concentrated yellow is going to be at the site of infection. And the farther away you go from it, the yellow fades and fades and fades. And so as cells that are going through the blood, like T cells and B cells and monocytes are able to see this trail, they follow it until they get to the end of the trail where it's the brightest, and then they find the pathogen that they need to deal with. And that's exactly what's gonna happen in the case of SARS-CoV-2. We're going to bring in all these immune cells to the lung. And so if you click on one more uh, advancement, what you find is because this virus stops the IRFs, we can block a major part of the call to arms, but we're gonna leave the call for reinforcements on full blast. And that dynamic is basically the underlying biology of COVID. All right, next slide. All right, so how does this all connect? Why am I even talking about this in this way? Let's go to the next one. Um, so we're gonna really get into hamsters here, okay? And so like, I don't in 45 minutes really have a, the time to convince you that the hamster is really the perfect model for all things SARS-CoV-2, um, but there are lots and lots of publications out there that, that validate it. And I'm gonna show you that I, I think I have yet to see any aspect of COVID disease um, un being unable to be replicated in the SARS-CoV-2 hamster model. Um, and this is totally stochastic, of course. This is really just has to do with the fact that the hamster's um, uh, protein sequence for its ACE2 receptor just happens to be more compatible with this virus and more human-like in this one respect than our normal go-to small animal models like um, uh, mice. And so if you wanted to use mice in SARS-CoV-2, you either have to adapt the mouse to have a more human-like ACE2, or you have to adapt the virus to be able to look be able to recognize the mouse version of ACE2. And those, both of those things come with consequences and it kind of changes the biology between host and virus. And for that reason, we really stick with the, the, the hamster model. Um, next slide. 
All right, so um, you know, one of the early, early studies, a uh, really great study that came out of um, uh, kind of a joint lab that exists both in Japan and in the US here from um, Yoshi Kawaoka's group, um, showed that uh, if you look at the lungs of SARS-CoV-2 infected mice, you can see something that's often referred to as this ground glass opacity. And basically what you're looking at here is the fact that your lungs are taking on fluid, which makes it much more difficult to breathe, which of course is the ARS of SARS, is the respiratory uh, distress um, uh, syndrome, uh, the acute respiratory syndrome. Um, and you know what you're looking at here is basically that you know in a mock lung you see a nice healthy see-through lung, but in a SARS-CoV-2 infected lung you're now seeing these like essentially like clouds forming inside the lungs that look a lot like SARS-CoV-2 people when they're hospitalized, which is what you see on the left there. Um, so just just to say that it's mimic, it's phenocopying, we call it the, the disease. It looks very much the same. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, we we also got in very much into the hamster model. And of course, hamsters are not widely used in the lab for, for most uh, viral studies. So this was was a learning curve for most of us. Um, and so to the left is this is just kind of characterizing the model. But I, I put it in here because I wanted the audience to appreciate how consistent this is and, you know, how much we can leverage this animal model to learn more about how to treat this disease and, you know, what causes this disease and even get into long COVID at the end. And so SGN, if you now remember, is the subgenomic version of N. So it's member that did that, that crazy acrobatic loop of the polymerase on the RNA. And we're just giving a virus in the nose to hamsters at increasing concentration. So in the first column, we give them just 10 infectious viruses, very, very little, then 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000, and so on and so forth. And all I want you to appreciate is that in all cases, the animal gets infected and propagates that infection. Um, in fact, the more you add, um, you actually see that the overall levels go down a little bit. That is a, a strange um, reality of the fact that viruses, being as sloppy as they are, start making broken versions of themselves, and that's what causes that phenomenon. And then to the right, I want you just to appreciate that if we look at this by plaque forming units, the one in the middle there, yeah, um, that is a, a really good measurement of, so when we want to know if virus is present in a tissue, we can, um, we can take a snapshot of its RNA like we've been talking about, which doesn't really tell you if the virus is replicating or infectious, it just tells you that it was there or pieces of it are there. Um, this is an assay where we're going to look, we're going to take liquid from the tissue of interest that we're talking about, um, and we're going to put it onto other cells, and we're going to see if it can establish an infection in there, which would tell you it's infectious. And you can appreciate that, uh, you know, three days after infection, every single hamster has 10 to the 6 uh, individual virions per milliliter of homogenous that we have. So they're very, very high levels. And you can see every one of those dots is a hamster, and you can see the fact that they're all clustered together. That's how consistent this is. Um, and this obviously you can do this by RNA, which is the one on the right. Uh, next slide. Uh, yes, there's a question about long COVID. We're going to get there. I, I should probably speed up a little bit. All right. And so this is to say that like you don't have to artificially put it in their nose to cause an infection. Uh, if you give them infected bedding, they will get infected. So this is, we call this fomite transmission. If you give one hamster uh, SARS-CoV-2 and then put in a naive hamster, it will get SARS-CoV-2. If you put a drop of virus in the eye, the infection will catch in the lung uh, or you can do it intranasally. And again, all of this is true for humans as well, of course. Next slide. All right, and so what's actually happening is, um, so this is, um, we call this uh, uh, immunohistochemistry. So it's the staining of the lungs. So you're looking at really big airways here. So those big spaces is where every time you inhale, you're breathing the air through those large tubes and they're going into finer and finer tubes. But this is where you have your airway exchange, which happens to be those cells that are expressing ACE2. And so the carbon dioxide oxygen exchange is obviously critically of importance, but it's also the first thing that's gonna get hit by uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so on day two, you start to see these little brown spots right in that large area. Those are individual cells and the brown is staining of the nucleoprotein. So this is the appearance of virus. And I hope you can appreciate that those few individual cells on day two give birth to all cells on day four where the entire large bronchi is very, very infected and the virus is most definitely winning on day four. And then on day six, you've kind of exhausted your resources. You've killed a lot of your cells that make uh, that had ACE2, and so you're forced to go further and further into the tissue to find cells to continue replicating. And so on day six and day eight, you see it's getting more and more diffuse, but at this moment in time, you will see that you start making antibodies, you start um, fending off the virus, and by day 14, 
all the virus is gone, but ironically, there is still plenty of material left. And we are again going to get back to this phenomenon as I think there is quite a bit of significance. And this again has to do with the fact that the virus overall is quite a, a messy slob of a virus. And so it leaves so much material behind for the host to clean up that it comes with consequences. Uh, next slide. Um, there's a question here about whether I think that the subgenomic and relative expression might be due to different number of replicates used in the experiment. Um, sure, it's true that, so subgenomic N, if you're measuring it, is a good proxy for the amount of virus that either is there or was there. Um, subgenomic N is by far the most produced by the virus. It is the, the number one transcript that's made by the virus by a long shot, which is why we use uh, that as our thing to detect it. Uh, they're asking us about replicates, but overall, my whole point of that statement was that the hamster does turn out to be an incredibly um, robust model where we don't actually see a lot of variation from experiment to experiment. And so this is very much what you were just looking at. So on the top, that's again, um, measuring the amount of N you're getting in the lung over a 14-day time course. But on the bottom, uh, it's the same animals, the same kind of slides, except here we do staining called H&E. Um, and this is really uh, for physicians and pathologists where you can really tell what's happening in the lung thereafter because all the different immune cells stain slightly differently with this stain. And what I, all I really want you to gather from this though is that there should be white spaces. You see on mock and day two, there's lots of like little tunnels beside there that are just white unstained, right? And those are air pockets where your air needs to go in order for you to get oxygen and exchange it for CO2. But you can see on day six and day eight, well after the peak of infection, which was day four above, um, you can see that those air spaces are largely gone and you're now packed with just pinkness. <coughs> and we call that infiltration. So that is the, if you remember the call for reinforcements that we brought in all these uh, professional immune cells and they're coming to the lung because NF kappa B has been on this whole time and there's been a lot of chemokines being produced and so all the immune cells are now coming to the lung to try and clean up this debris and deal with this infection. And by day 14 in the most hamsters, um, the, the infection is resolving itself and the animal uh, gets better and recovers very much like the vast majority of people with SARS-CoV-2. Next slide. Okay. If we take a, just a slightly deeper dive, this is just a couple slides here. If we go to 100x power, so we zoom in a little bit at what's going on in the lungs, um, there's a number of things that are interesting. And so the first one to mention here is what we call edema. So this is very much like when you saw the ground glass opacity, the clouding of the lungs, it's the it's leakage. And so here, what you're looking at to the left, the bigger the bigger hole um, is your, air, your large airway. And then the little hole beside it where the red arrow is, that is a blood vessel, right? So obviously when you're doing oxygen CO2 exchange, you need to be providing those red blood cells, oxygenated red blood cells right to the blood. So those two things often run parallel to each other in the lungs. But there shouldn't be that like weird pinky fluid outside of the, the airway where the, red, where the red arrow is pointing. And that's edema, that is a sign that it's leaking. And it's usually leaking because of inflammation caused by the virus. And so what's interesting about this is that it's showing you that you get leakage even where you don't have active virus replication, which is why the entire lung becomes very cloudy. Uh, next slide. Um, if you zoom even further, now, so now we're right up into the large airways. Uh, the other thing that to note here is that at this moment in time, this is three days post-infection, um, now all of the cells that had ACE2 that were involved in your airways, they're all dead. Uh, the virus has infected them all and killed the vast majority of them. And now what's happening is you're getting this massive infiltration of a different type of cell called neutrophils. And the neutrophils are lining up where there should have been airway cells and they're just trying to basically deal with the mess. They're trying to clean up all of the debris left behind and they're trying to essentially you know, squash this inflammation and get rid of the virus, uh, you know, before the virus completely wins out here. And so this is, a, this is, you know, really the, the pr probably the worst part of the initial virus infection um, and probably really when you start coughing and having a difficult time being short of breath. Uh, next slide. And so if you zoom in even farther here, what you can actually see is evidence of these cells dying. And so I just wanted to, to appreciate that, like this is not always programmed cell death or apoptosis is labeled here, but this is really like every type of cell death. So there's like, there's different ways for cells to die and the virus basically triggers every possible type of death. If you get infected with this virus, that cell that was infected is basically, uh, you know, as good as dead within 24 hours uh, in, in some gruesome way. And you can even here see a lot of the red blood cells and stuff that are leaking into places where they're not supposed to be as a result of all of this damage and inflammation that has been caused. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so 
one of the interesting, really interesting things about this um, is that uh, if you look systemically what's going on, um, so to the left here, that graph you see, that's where we can grab a tissue and look for infectious virus. And long story short is you find lots of virus in the lung, lots of virus in the olfactory bulb, but everywhere else you find very little virus. And so the measurements are here, like how, these are out of animals. And so eight out of eight animals in the trachea have virus, eight out of eight animals have virus in the lung. But when you look at other things like um, the, the brain, or the GI tract, the pancreas, the kidney, it's much less consistent. It seems very stochastic as to whether or not a virus appears there or not. However, if you go to the next slide, if we take those snapshots that we were telling you about and we look for viral RNA, their viral RNA is more ubiquitous. You see viral RNA in tissues where you did not see virus. And that, again, really speaks to the biology that underlies COVID. Um, so if you go to the next slide, if you go even further on that snapshot and you say, what's happening in all these tissues? Okay, so these are your pancreas, your GI tract, your liver, your olfactory bulb, your spleen, your brain, your heart, your lung, and your kidney. Out of all of these, only your olfactory bulb and your lung actually have replicating virus in them. But here, every little square you see that's red is a sign that you're turning on your antiviral defenses. And so the major take home point here is that even though this infection is largely confined to your airways, your entire body is responding by eliciting this antiviral interferon response. And the reason it's doing that is because you're basically, this virus is making such a mess that that debris from that mess is entering into your circulation and it's triggering this kind of response in all of your tissues. So of course, if you are an individual that already had a kidney problem or already had a heart problem, getting SARS-CoV-2 is going to stress out that organ and push it. And so if it has any weakness whatsoever, this is when those core morbidities really come back to haunt you. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip a couple slides. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll just skip this one. Uh, yeah, we'll skip this one. Uh, skip this one. I'll, I'll tell you what this all meant in a second. Um, just go to the next one. I want to get to that. All right, so those slides were just really to say that the reason why we see systemic inflammation is because the virus is a slob, if you remember. Basically, we get debris from that infection, gets into the circulation, and everybody responds to it. All right, I don't want to get onto this, uh, this other work. So while that's all happening in your overall body, I also mentioned that in addition to the lungs, your olfactory bulb does have active replication, which is unusual. So if we go back to the nose and go to the next slide, let's see what's happening in the nose. And so this is right back to that single cell sequencing, but this is a really cool experiment, just got published. Um, and so we're looking at hamsters here, uh, mock uninfected hamsters, infect hamsters infected at one day post-infection, hamsters infected at three days post-infection, and hamsters at 10 days where the virus is gone. And again, we're just taking a quick snapshot of individual cells, but we can use that snapshot of RNA to be able to figure out what kind of cells they are, whether or not they have virus, and whether or not you know, they're responding to virus, for example. And so you can see the different types of cells that you have in your olfaction system on just a regular given day. And if you go to the next slide, we're gonna remember these shapes. But now what we're gonna do is we're gonna color in the things we're interested in. So let's just look at the top for now. We're gonna color in SARS-CoV-2N. So basically in that snapshot, wherever we see a piece of RNA that comes from virus, we're gonna circle that cell blue. And so what you hope you can appreciate is that at one day post-infection, all the blue dots are really kind of down at the bottom of that shape in a variety of spaces. And then on day three, those same blue dots kind of disappear in that space, but they go way up to the top at three days post-infection and at 10 days they're gone. So I'm sorry, but if you just uh, go back one slide for one minute, that corresponds to, if you look on one day post-infection, there's an orange blob called sus cells, which are really just like epithelial cells that have this very much a structural role. Um, and what's happening is that they get infected by virus and the virus kills those cells. And so if you look between one day and three days post-infection, the population of sus cells drastically drops. Now that's not such a terrible thing because sus cells are just really structural. They don't really, they're not the neurons that are causing you to smell. That's in the old factory there. You can see old factory, um, neurons um, nearby, but they're not actually the ones involved in the infection. And what's interesting is, again, if you remember at three days post-infection, the blue signal went up. Well, those are all of your immune cells. You can see them as microglia and macrophages here labeled on three days post-infection. So again, advance one slide further. And so SARS basically comes in, infects those sus cells. The sus cells die. They make so much debris and such a mess that all of our professional janitors, the microglia and the, and the macrophages, have to pick up all that debris. And that's why now you see that blue signal in those cells at three days post-infection. 
the graph below that is called ISG15. This is just a one particular gene of that that call to arms that we just talked about, the interferon response. And you can appreciate that, like even though the infection is only in a few cells, the response to that, again, because it makes so much debris, uh, is really, really uh, strong. And as a result of that very strong response, your neurons that are normally involved in expressing receptors that can allow you to smell, their bandwidth is suddenly taken up by building up their antiviral defenses. And as they're building up their antiviral defenses, they no longer have the bandwidth to keep up with smell, and that's why you lose your smell. And the reason you get it back is that by 10 days post-infection, this eventually all goes back down to baseline and resets. And that's the beauty of your smell hopefully coming back. Uh, next slide. And so you can zoom in on this and see that your smell disappears. So this ADCY3, that's a snapshot of a gene that's involved in smell. And you can see that in animals that get infected, that message goes away. And that's really the only point here, that this is why you can't smell after your, uh, your nose gets infected. Um, next slide. And so this happens in hamsters too. So, uh, I mean, in people and in hamsters, and so we can test this. So in fact, we just take Cocoa Krispies and we bury them underneath their bedding and we determine how long it takes for a hamster to find it because obviously it can't see the Cocoa Krispies so it has to smell them out. And for this, we benchmark everything against an influenza infection just because we wanna know what are attributes of just you know being infected by a virus versus what are attributes that SARS-CoV-2 actually causes this. And you know, long story short, very much like in people, hamsters get a nausea or a lack of smell, but eventually it comes back and everybody's fine. Next slide. And so how does it finally resolve? Like that's, a, that's obviously a, an important question. So if you go to the next slide, um, again, very much like us, what we see is, um, so onto the left here is just weight change. So when you get hamsters, hamsters really love to eat. Uh, and so if you just give them like a sham virus or some kind of mock treatment, they basically just continue to gain weight forever as they live in the animal facility happy. Um, however, if you give them SARS-CoV-2, um, they feel less great, obviously, they don't, uh, they have this respiratory distress, um, and they don't actually lose weight per se, but they basically stop eating because they they don't feel great, and so they just plateau. However, you can see that by day uh, seven to the right there, those are antibodies that are being made to this virus. And so very much like the average healthy individual of young age, when you get this virus, eventually your immune system figures out what it is, remembers it, and then you know, works to neutralize it through the production of antibodies. Uh, next slide. And so you, know, you can actually get really into this. And so this is actually where GenScript really came in uh, uh, very helpful in that you can make different uh, peptides to understand at a very, very, you know, way, way deep in the weeds of how the immune cells recognize virus. And this really comes in these two different forms. So uh, B cells make the antibodies that many of us hear about after, you know, a vaccine, but T cells also play a very important role in that they can recognize infected cells, you know, very early on and make sure they get rid of those cells so the virus can't propagate. And this work here was really just showing the contribution that both B, B cells and T cells are very much involved in this process to ensure that you can get rid of virus. And so when things like Omicron show up and people panic because B cells you know, aren't necessarily protecting against Omicron based on the way they were against the original Wuhan strain, it's not always as dire as people make it sound because you're not actually measuring a whole aspect of the immune response, which is coming from T cells. Uh, and that's just because it's much harder to measure T cells. Uh, next slide. All right, so here's the two models we're gonna quickly test, and we're gonna use this to really get into long COVID. And so we take SARS-CoV-2, we infect an animal, and what you're looking at here, these are just four animals on day one, three, five, seven, and 14, and you're looking at the total amount of virus that's in their lungs at, at those particular times. And again, you can see all four animals track very well. The infection basically is producing a lot of virus for the first five days, then that immune system kicks in, and by two weeks out, there is no more virus left. Um, the one on the right is the exact same animal, it's hamsters, but this is a influenza infection. So it's also an RNA virus. It's also in the respiratory tract, but a totally different family of viruses. This is actually swine flu, uh, the pandemic we had in 2009, which was much more mild in comparison. Uh, and it has a very similar biology. Actually, the hamsters deal with that a little bit faster. But again, by day three, they have very similar viral loads between the two viruses. And by day 14, the virus is, uh, is, is gone. And those are gonna be the two time points we initially focus on. Uh, next slide. All right, so let's take a snapshot again and say what's happening into these animals. And so on the top, those are your lungs, and on the bottom, they're all your old factory bulb. And so if you remember, um, uh, so basically on this one, blue means that genes are going up um, and uh, pink means they're going down. And it doesn't really matter what these genes are, but these are really depicting the, the aspects of your antiviral defense. 
And so, you know, just quickly, you take flu or SARS, you infect animals, and on day three, you see many of the same genes turn on. So all these blue genes that are turning on, these are all of your antiviral defenses. And by 31 days after infection, so a whole month after infection, your lungs are pink and healthy again, and everybody's fine. And so that happens regardless of whether or not you're infected with flu or SARS and you're young and healthy. Where the scene changes is the step below that in the old factory bulb. And so that's the one we were just looking at at the single cell level. And there on day three, again, you see that both flu and SARS induce a response, but you can appreciate that SARS is inducing a, a bigger response, it's a darker blue. And that's because, again, remember it's a sloppier, messier virus, so it's going to elicit more of a signal. But what's really surprising and really unique is that when you go out to day 31, a month after the fact, now you can see that even though with flu, everything went back down to baseline like you would have expected it to, for the olfactory bulb, SARS-CoV-2 looks like it's still infected even though there's no virus there. And this is the, 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 was really the rationale for why we kept digging to see if there was long COVID there because this is unusual. Everywhere else in the hamster, all the other organs that were not anywhere near the brain all go back to baseline on day 31. This is the exception to the rule that the olfactory bulb does this. And so we went deeper into the brain after seeing this. Uh, next slide. And so just to really quick recap, basically, if you look closely, you can find the virus replicates very well in, that, in those, those sus cells, if you remember correctly. Um, it's very easy to detect them by protein and by RNA in the lung on day three. But at day 31, no matter how hard you look, you will not find any virus, no infectious units, no protein, no RNA. There's nothing left there, yet the tissue is behaving like it's still infected. And this is a really important part of the message I'm trying to convey in the remaining eight minutes that I have here. Uh, next slide. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go deep, deep into the brain. So this was in close health with some, some neurobiologists and behavioral biologists and an amazing MD, PhD student in my lab uh, named Justin Frere. Uh, and basically what they did was they isolated very specific regions of different hamsters. So cerebellum, prefrontal cortex, the olfactory bulb, the striatum, the thalamus, and the trigeminal ganglia. And they basically said, what is happening to these different areas of the brain? Are, are they infected by virus? Are they not going back, going back down to baseline? What's happening here? And so you can find, again, pieces of RNA virus in those cells, very much like you could when we went and looked all over the body of the hamster or of cadavers from COVID individuals. Um, but there's no evidence that there's actually replication competent virus there, just kind of inflammatory material, presumably from the dead and dying sus cells or something similar to those uh, that have caused this. Um, next slide. And so, you know, what's a little scary is this is just a slightly different way to show it. So here, what you're looking at is every gene in blue or red is a significant gene that's going either up, meaning it's, it's bending to the right, or going down, which means it's bending to the left. And they're all very significant, meaning that we've done this in, in many animals and the results are very reproducible. And you're looking at day three and day 31 in all these different areas. And so you can appreciate that, like it's one, it's not uniform. So on day three, for example, the prefrontal cortex and the thalamus show no activity at all. They look totally healthy and fine, just like the controls. Uh, that, which is also true for day 31 for the prefrontal cortex. Um, whereas others like the striatum, you see lots of genes going up and down in both directions on both day three and 31, which is true for the olfactory bulb, uh, the thalamus, uh, uh, both. Um, we're seeing transcriptional changes that are not being resolved like they should be. And when you take a deep dive into those, um, those really do um, involve a lot of things regarding metabolism, like RNA metabolism and energy and inflammation, um, which are also many of the same triggers that we see in transcriptional snapshots of say Alzheimer's patients or ALS patients. It does suggest a certain amount of inflammation and problem in these very you know, uh, deep uh, neuronal circuits. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, this actually does play out in that when we do tests on these animals, um, the best one uh, being the one on the left there, which is the marble bearing test. So what you do here is you basically take a hamster cage and you put marbles into the cage and you basically measure how long it takes them to bury the marbles. And in mice, this is usually viewed as like a, a measurement of anxiety. Um, and none of this has actually been done in hamsters because it's a relatively new model. So I don't want to overinterpret our results. But what we are comparing is um, mock treated animals to animals infected with flu and then recovered versus animals infected with SARS-CoV-2 and then recovered. And all I really want you to appreciate is that while there was no significant difference between mock and flu animals to the point where we could actually group them together in this way, um, SARS-CoV-2 infected animals are performing in a way that would suggest that many of them have now alt abnormal, abnormal behaviors. And so with marble bearing, for example, if you recover from SARS-CoV-2, those animals were just um, far less interested in bearing uh, marbles than their, their controlled counterparts. 
um, time to approach is you put food in the light and they're in the dark and you measure how, how long it takes for them to overcome their fear to get it. Uh, whereas the one on the right, the, the time to first immobility is uh, basically a swim test where you measure how long it takes them to give up. And in all these cases, our SARS-CoV-2 recovered animals are showing abnormal behaviors from what they should be showing, suggesting that very much like people, there is a long lasting effect that, that, that hangs on well post viral clearance. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so that I did make it to the end before the hour. Um, and so I, you know, I, the real major take home messages here, I think are that, you know, one, I think SARS-CoV-2, uh, you know, it came from the wild, it was not created in a lab. Um, it came from the wild and its biology is such that it makes, it makes quite a bit of a molecular mess. And that, that mess of RNA causes inflammation in the entire body, uh, including the brain. Um, and what's really interesting about that is that while the body resets itself very well after that inflammation, the brain takes much longer to do that. And that really is uh, the molecular basis for both why COVID hurts older people and those with comorbidities because of the systemic inflammation, as well as being the underlying uh, factor for how it can cause long COVID, because obviously you are changing the transcriptional signaling of different areas of your brain to, to alter totally stochastic different aspects of, of, of behavior or memory, which is why the disease is so heterogeneous in nature. Uh, and so with that, I go to the next slide. Um, just to, I would be remiss if I didn't thank um, my people and our funding foundations. You know, uh, the vast, vast majority of this work was funded actually by DARPA, which is part of the Department of Defense. Uh, the Zeger Family Foundation, the Haas Family Foundation have provided amazing uh, support as well. Um, you know, this work is actually a uh, accumulation of, of many, many people and many collaborations, far too many to, to talk about at this moment, other than to say uh, Justin Frayer did do a lot of this long COVID stuff. He's very active on Twitter. So if you want to learn more, certainly should engage him. Um, but with that, I'll, if there's time, I'll answer questions, but I'm going to give it back to uh, Sonia Hunt and say thank you for listening and attending. Wow, you got through a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did take a breath in there someplace. Somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that, Benjamin. It was very insightful and very detailed, and I hope all the audience members really enjoyed it. Uh, now we're going to try to see if we can get through some of the questions that have come through. Uh, remember, audience members, you can send in your questions by using that chat box, and if we can't attend to them, uh, the team at GenScript will follow up with you. Now, uh, Benjamin, before I start with the questions that just came in, did you want to answer any of the previous ones that I sent? to you or just start with the ones that I just received? Uh, let's see. Uh, I will try and answer. Um, um, why don't you just answer, ask me a question and I'll see. Okay, no worries. Okay, no worries. Okay. Uh, this audience member just sent in and they're asking, the scientific community is divided about the underlying cause of systemic type 1 interferon signaling. How are you sure that there is no virus remaining in the animal after 7 to 10 days? Right. Uh, so this is a great question. Uh, it's a really good question um, because obviously, you know, the fact that you can get long COVID would suggest that it's really one of two possibilities. Either there is something that has fundamentally changed that is self-propagating and not resolving itself to cause long COVID, which is what I'm proposing. But you could also envision that there is a virus that's still present and inducing damage at some low level. And the problem with that is that it's obviously if it doesn't exist, it's very hard and it's not impossible to prove something doesn't exist. Um, and so what we do in this space, um, it's a bit tricky because um, if you are a human individual who you know gets hospitalized and unfortunately fall, succumbs to infection, um, those individuals, uh, you know, that kind of tissue before it would ever come to a lab that could be able to test for infectivity uh, is almost always fixed um, to make it safe for transport. Um, but that process would kill any infectivity. And so really all you can do for the most part with, with human biopsy samples or human cadaver samples is to just check that snapshot kind of technique where you look for a protein or for an RNA. And that has been done and you can find evidence of it. We also see evidence of that, of RNA in the brain or RNA in tissues where we don't think replication actually occurs. Uh, and so it creates a very uh, quick controversy by saying, well, how did that material get there? Is it, is it replicating virus or is it just debris? Uh, and so what we do is this is where the hamsters again shine in that if you 
if you can accept the fact that the hamster is just a small person uh, and you give them um, SARS and you then measure virus everywhere, we can take the, each individual organ or brain compartment and we basically you squish them to take out any kind of the liquid or fluid that's inside of them. And you can take that fluid directly and try and look for infectious virus. Uh, that's that's the most um, uh, traditional way to look for infectivity. But a second way to do this, which is even more sensitive, is to take that uh, crushed tissue, or we call it homogenized tissue, and you literally add it on to like uh, super permissive cells. So there are cell lines that we use in the lab that live in petri dishes from like African green monkey cells, for example, that are engineered to just be it's how we grow the virus, for example. So they're just, they've been stripped of all their defenses. So just easy, easy pickings for a virus. And so you would envision that like, even if there was a single infectious particle in a given tissue, under that kind of experimental platform, the virus should grow out and that would allow you to say, okay, there was infectious virus there. And very, very few people actually have the ability to do that experiment because it requires a very high containment facility and would have to be like tied into an autopsy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so in hamsters, obviously, we can do this all in one pipeline without any disruption whatsoever. And when we do that, that's kind of the data I was showing there that, you know, we don't find infectious material in the brain ever. Um, we do find infection material in the olfactory bulb and in the lungs. And then everywhere else, it's just like, it's very sporadic. So if you did this to 10 hamsters, you know, out of 10 hamsters, you know, one hamster out of the 10, we might be able to pull some replicating competent virus out of the heart, for example. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, um, and that, that, that might represent true um, in that it might be that, um, actually some of the work I skipped over because it was clear I wasn't going to have enough time, mm -hmm. is that um, when the virus is replicating the lungs and it's inducing all of this debris and damage, a lot of that material that's getting into your circulation is causing that system-wide inflammation that I was speaking about. And while that's obviously bad, you know, it's a hard thing to go through to push all of your organs into this inflammatory process. It also does some good in that if the virus were to ever get out of the lungs and into the bloodstream or into the interstitial fluid of your body, if it gets to your heart and it can infect your heart, but your heart is already inflamed because of all the debris that happened a couple of days prior, it won't actually infect your heart. And so um, some of the data I skipped actually proves that point. It was done in, in Belgium. But if you take a hamster, for example, and you short circuit its ability to communicate in that way, then the virus goes everywhere. So it's almost like the systemic inflammation that the virus induces actually limits itself in that it causes so much inflammation everywhere where it's not, it can't go anywhere anymore because every time it tries to break into a new tissue, that tissue is so inflamed that it can't make ground there. And so this like sporadic um, sighting of a virus in a heart here or a pancreas there, you know, it might be real. It could be stochastic situations where, you know, people do see some limited virus replication in certain tissues, but it is not the norm. Um, and I don't think it is the molecular basis of long COVID. I don't think we see any kind of uh, active replication in the brain, um, and I don't think we're going to in the future. Okay, I'm gonna squeeze in one last question. This is a very interesting one. This uh, audience member is asking, the title suggested you were going to talk about the past, present, and future events of the pandemic. You spoke about the past and the present, but no, not about the future. What do you think happens after Omicron? Yeah, I, you know, I, I did not come up with the title um, and uh, I was going to speak about the future, but, you know, that's a, it's a fool's game, really. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I have become quite optimistic in my in my old age. Um, and, you know, I know that many of my virology counterparts might not agree with, to this answer, but I really do think that the virus is running out of runway space. Um, mm -hmm. You can only mutate your spike so much without compromising you know, other aspects of its biology. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would like to think that Omicron is actually our last one for, for a good long while, and we should have you know, um, a zero conversion uh, in the planet to a level where we can probably keep it, and it will probably emerge here and there uh, periodically as Omicron or Delta or some you know, sub-variant of those two. But I do think that the entire pandemic takes a major turn for the better here and we go back to normal. Um, but that's just my opinion. Okay, well, thank you very much, audience members, for those questions. We have reached the end of the, ans uh, the question and answer portion of the webinar. I know there's a lot of questions there that we were not able to answer, but uh, please utilize the email addresses that are on your screen. And I'm sure the team at Genscript or Benjamin would be very happy to address them. For All sure. Right, so
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow-up email from X Talks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen. Your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve on our further webinars. Now, give me a few seconds. I'm going to send you a link in your chat box. You'll be able to view the recording of this event at that link and also share this link with your colleagues once they register for the recording as well. So I encourage you to do that. And now let's please thank our speaker, Benjamin, for that very insightful presentation and for answering your questions. So thank you, Benjamin. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me, Sonia. Okay. You, we hope you found this webinar informative. It has been my pleasure to be your webinar moderator. On behalf of the team here at XTalks, we thank you for joining us. I'm Sonia Hunt. Until next time, please take care and bye for now. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again. All right. Bye.